Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to Maastricht. I hope you've been enjoying a very nice first day of the conference already. And I also hope that you already managed to explore lovely sunny Maastricht already a little bit. And you picked a nice warm day to be here. Tomorrow there's going to be rain, so better take care of the sunshine still today. Also welcome to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, my name is Esther Versluis. I'm a professor of European Regulatory Governance and I'm chair of the politics department here. And this year is actually a pretty special year for us here in Maastricht. Uh, not only will we be uh, commemorating 30 years of Maastricht Treaty, but it is also the year in which we can celebrate that our Bachelor European Studies exists for 20 years already. Patrick, we're old. We've been teaching it for 20 years already. In the past 20 years, we've had the pleasure of uh, educating new generations of students uh, about Europe, European integration. And in that sense, it's also a really nice pleasure to see you here today. Uh, the new generation of academic scholars analyzing the ins and outs of the current issues related to Europe and the ongoing European integration processes. And this is also the topic of our roundtable today, uh, commemorating 30 years of Maastricht Treaty, which is a wonderful opportunity to look back and reflect upon what this milestone in European integration actually brought to us. The treaty was negotiated and signed here in Maastricht a year before I actually started here as a student studying here in Maastricht. And to be honest, at that time, I was completely oblivious to the importance of what was happening. I was also not very much interested in Europe and European integration. I had the luxury of growing up in a stable environment in Western Europe where there, not, there were not that many things in life that actually troubled us. So I had the luxury of being allowed not to care so much. What a different world we live in today. Having lived through a financial crisis, a migration crisis, increasing international terrorism, a worldwide pandemic, climate change, a war in Ukraine, to name just a few, the current generation, unfortunately, does not have the luxury of being oblivious to the world around us. Now, what did the Maastricht Treaty contribute to how we experience European integration today? As you know, the Maastricht Treaty was signed in the aftermath of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany and meant to mark a new and positive stage in the process of European integration. It promoted the objective of an ever closer union, attempting to bring the union closer to its citizens. So where are we now today? What marks did this Maastricht Treaty leave? And what does the future look like for a European project at a time of rising populism and war on our continent? Reflecting on these broad questions, we have a wonderful panel with three speakers who can each approach this broad topic from a different perspective. We will start today with Mathieu Segers. Mathieu is professor in contemporary European history and European integration here at our faculty. And Mathieu plays a very important role in the Dutch public debate, showing the importance of analyzing our recent history for understanding Europe today. He does so by publishing regularly in various sorts of Dutch media, and he has recently been appointed in the Dutch Scientific Council for Government Policy. Mathieu will start our debate by focusing on the historical context of the treaty. Our next speaker is Andrew Duff. Andrew was a member of the European Parliament and spokesman for the Liberal Group on Constitutional Affairs from 1999 until 2014. That's a long period, Andrew. <laughs> he was a member of the Convention on the Charter of Fundamental Rights and of the Convention on the Future of Europe. And he was also the, one of the Parliament's representatives in the Intergovernmental Conference, which drafted the Lisbon Treaty. Andrew will continue our discussion, focusing on how things played out in the aftermath of signing the treaty. Last but not least, we have Noelle O'Connell. Noelle is the CEO of the European Movement Ireland, uh, Ireland's longest established not-for-profit membership organization connecting Ireland and Europe. And in addition, she's the vice president of the European Movement International. And Noelle will draw on her experience as being a national citizen representative and member of the Conference on the Future of Europe, and will have an outward uh, looking uh, contribution to our debate and we'll reflect on where the EU is headed. I would like beforehand a warm round of applause for our panelists today. And, yeah. and I would like to ask uh, Mathieu to get started. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for the welcoming words and the introduction. 
uh, already uh, also some content in that introduction that I can build upon. Uh, I think what is very important, I want to stress the historical background of the Maastricht Treaty a bit and then speak about three promises that are enshrined in the treaty and that are under uh, serious stress at the moment given the current circumstances in Europe and the world. So first, the moment um, of 1991, December 1991, was the moment when the treaty was signed here in Maastricht. It was a very special moment because not only a German unification was a fact then for a couple of weeks, uh, but also um, uh, a couple of months, I must say, but also uh, the end of the Cold War was evident uh, as a new fact of life in, in, in the world uh, that was crystallizing uh, at that moment in time. And in this context, this treaty was very ambitious. It was the first political uh, statement, you could say, of the Europe of European integration as an autonomous player in a new 21st century world. And there were three specific promises in the treaty that are still very relevant today and that say something about that ambition then, because times were pretty positive and Esther also hinted at that. So the atmosphere was positive, forward-looking, um, and also very ambitious in the sense of enlargement, not only geographically, but also in terms of norms and values spread uh, by European integration and through European integration to the rest of Europe, but also to the rest of the world, actually. And I think it can be stressed enough that this was a, a, actually a dia diaphragm and a vacuum, so to say, in European history, this period between the fall of the Berlin Wall and 9-11. That was a decade that is very special. It was an aberration in European history in the sense that violence, war, uh, although we had the Yugoslavian wars, not to forget, but was something that was conceived as uh, a challenge that could be you know, uh, overcome in, in, in the next decades through, for instance, uh, the process of European integration. Now, that said, I think that that moment is very special and should, we should never forget that this treaty was signed at that time. Um, then the three promises. The first promise of the Treaty of Maastricht was actually a geopolitical promise and it's very topical today uh, because this was the ambition of the Europe of European integration to become more than a market alone, to become also a player in international politics. And this was why the second pillar in the treaty, you know about the second pillar, of course, the security uh, and defense policy was created. Uh, and still is, you know, kind of a promise in today's European Union and now very much under pressure, of course, to deliver upon this promise uh, due to the situation uh, in Ukraine. Um, that geopolitical moment was seized because it was, this was a big step, but it was not fleshed out in the treaty. So it was very general uh, terms, uh, general ambitions and the all, all the how was still to be you know, uh, uh, negotiated and, 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 and worked out. Um, and up until today, not that much uh, has happened maybe in that second pillar. And uh, we are confronted now with the results, but others, other panelists will probably uh, speak in more detail uh, on that. So that first promise is a very relevant promise today, but the, the, it, 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 the situation is so serious that we are in a phase where we, where we are facing the, the, the test of this promise. Was this a false promise? Can Europe, the Europe of European integration deliver in the domain of security and defense policy? We will see the coming years, very important. Then the second promise is a promise of what I would like to call social justice. It's also very relevant at the time in Maastricht. Um, and that goes back actually to the beginning of European integration. What we often forget is that shortly after the Second World War, uh, the European integration project was, was based on, a, on a, twin, a twin base, you could say. It was both about security. First thing was external security. It was working together to defend yourself against the communist threat and, and, and future threats. 
Uh, but the other uh, security thing was about individual security, individual security for Europeans, because the lesson learned from the interbellum and the Great Depression was that if you have too much segregation in your society, if there's too much, uh, um, too, too, mu too many people are poor, if, the, um, uh, if there is too much uh, um, uh, un unequalness in society, and this is uh, a very fertile ground for extreme politics like fascism, Nazism, nationalism, and for, for violence in society and across society. So this lesson was very, taken very seriously actually in the 50s, in the first steps of European integration, um, as a key goal of European integration to create more equality in the post-war Western European societies by social policy, and that this was also uh, a task for the European, the Europe of European integration. So the European institutions uh, created at that time. Um, it never really came to hard commitments in treaties on this. And Maastricht was a moment where Europe, Europe of European integration, uh, of course, uh, saw that it was time to step up its game and to take this position in, in, in the new uh, international relations. And one of the key objectives of the Treaty of Maastricht is to put flesh on the bones of this social justice promise. But that never really flew because of UK resistance in the negotiations, because, but also because of the lack of willingness, political will in the decades following the Treaty of Maastricht to really uh, do something on the European level with this promise. So also this promise is very topical today, as you all know, and is also very much under pressure by the uh, circumstances of today. Then the last promise, and the last promise is the promise of citizenship. In the European Union uh, that was created through the uh, Treaty of Maastricht, European citizenship was introduced as an ambition. What we can say at this moment is it's still a halfway house. It's still very much about citizenship in the context of the internal market. And then you talk about producers, consumers, and not much more. So this citizen, this European citizen is still alive in the treaty, but not yet to be seen in reality uh, that much. And on the other hand, also this promise is very much under pressure of current circumstances, crisis with rule of law in several member states, um, other challenges that are, for instance, related to refugees that put this promise, this third promise of the Treaty of Maastricht on the, on the severe stress test at the moment. I think all three promises are extremely urgent. Uh, and I think all three promises are put to a very severe stress test at the moment, where it's not clear if EU in present form will succeed to deliver enough uh, on these promises to keep the credibility in the next uh, two to three decades. Uh, so I will end on that uh, slightly pessimistic note uh, and hand over to, uh, to the next speaker. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. To be asked is always nice. Uh, I also find it when I come here back to Maastricht rather nostalgic. I was uh, 30 something years ago, I was outside with torches on a d d demonstration. Um, I don't know if you, do, do you have torches still in your, on your demonstrations? But uh, I thought at the time it was a bit crazy, but we enjoyed ourselves and we made a noise and we had a lot of beer. Uh, so it's very nice to be back. I've been back 20, uh, on the 20th, uh, uh, birthday of the treaty, and it's interesting to keep on changing one's perspective as you grow older. I've been at all the uh, the, 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 the the IGCs that have re re revised the treaties ever since, either as a participant or as a co commentator, and often as a critic. Um, they are good things to have for students of integration because they, they photograph 
the uh, st st state of play at the time, for all time. They uh, expose the uh, balance of power between the institutions, the commission, parliament, and so forth. And especially important when it comes to a, a, an IGC, the uh, balance of power between the big states and the little states which is always a very important uh, factor in achieving agreement if there is an agreement. They all try to do, all IGCs try to do a, the same kind of thing. They all claim that they're going to introduce simplicity and clarity into the treaties, and on the whole, they uh, don't. They also try to codify settled a case law from the Court of Justice. That's easier and is often successfully done. They all claim that they're trying to enhance the capacity to act of the EU. And on the whole, they don't succeed in doing that. They often claim stupidly that this is it. This is the settlement of the political and institutional struggle of the European Union. Of course, that doesn't ever, that, that has never happened and it, and it probably isn't uh, to achieve that. In a sense, each IGC is a, a training for the next one. It's, it's a preparation for the IGC that is to follow up. And it's important to recall how important they are in the day to day politics of the EU. They take a long time. The, the first decision to have an IGC was taken in December 1989 that was going to focus only on the currency issue. And the thing wasn't completed, as you know, until November 1993. So for all of that time, it was in the newspapers. And the term crisis was popularized across the press uh, in all, in all l l l languages for all of that time. All um, IGCs claim to be transformative, but in this case, it was. Maastricht was a transformative treaty, it, 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 but it was not definitive, as I've said earlier, but it was a ceasefire. It paused the quarrel between federalists and nationalists for a bit, uh, not for long, but for a bit. It w would not have succeeded had it not been for the powerful personalities there. Delors, uh, Mitterrand, Cole, L L Lubbers ought not to be uh, uh, neglected in this, uh, were all um, uh, experienced, powerful, often very l large people with an awful lot of history on their uh, uh, sh 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 uh, sh sh shoulders. We haven't always had uh, such grand personalities at every subsequent IGC, and we certainly don't have them uh, this afternoon in Brussels at the meeting of the Council of, of the of the of the U U U European C C C C Council. And I think that uh, something that is of great credit to those great people is that they were very tolerant of three irritating countries who'd turned up into the EU a bit late. Britain, D Denmark, and Ireland, who are all troublemakers all the time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the restructuring of the treaties that took place at Ma Maastricht has had a, a long le legacy. It's been very uh, 
difficult to uh, uh, to get ri rid of the pillarization which was introduced at that stage. The uh, fact that CFSP is in the TEU, whereas everything else isn't, uh, is 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 a, is a that's a, that's a sh sh uh, shadow of um, um, mastery which in the constitutional treaty of uh, 2004, we successfully transcended, but then of course that didn't work. Uh, and so we had in Lisbon to bring back the pillar to placate the nationalists. By the way, I speak in crudely of, of, of I categorize uh, people in this, in this business of being oh, federalists or uh, nationalists because it's, it's clearer, you know, there's no uh, nonsense. Um, and um, I'm a oh, federalist, by the way. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing, as I've uh, just uh, intimated earlier, is that uh, oh, Maastricht absolutely f failed to simplify and clarify the treaties. So there's anything more opaque and confusing than the treaty. Uh, and it took a long time to explain and, to, and perhaps to justify, especially to the press who discovered it was enormously uh, problematic. Um, it was good for the parliament. It brought in a, 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 a legislative co-decision plus qualified majority vote, whose scope has gradually expanded in all uh, subsequent treaties. It had a cooperation procedure where Parliament's am, am amendments could be uh, were, were accepted if they were not uh, re rejected by the c c council who had to act with all member states agreeing to re reject the parliamentary amendments. And that that process is 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 uh, if you if you have a look at the Treaty of Lisbon, indeed, that is. Uh, uh, in some respects, also there, as is the assent procedure, as is the the article which permits Parliament to re request the Commission to draft a law. That was introduced also at Momo Maastricht. The federalist principle of subsidiarity was uh, was a articulated, not I think very successfully, but anyway, it was inscribed in the treaty, entrenched in the treaty ever since, and it was justiciable in some degree at the Court of Justice. The degree to which subsidiarity is justiciable has also increased across the decades. It struggled to sharpen the identity of the EU, and as Mamachir has spoken of that, um, with a degree of success, but we're, we're, we're frustrated even now that we don't really know what, what the EU is for. And certainly third countries find it very difficult to really appreciate our complexity and our purpose. We haven't got there yet, and we won't get there before we have the constitutional settlement that we're striving for. We are for federalists, that is. Um, of course, it was historically important because of the decision on the currency to create the economic and monetary union. Um, 
but they, these great chaps, Co Mitterrand, Delors, put too, too much faith that their predecessors would complete the process of integration that was kicked off at Maastricht. They also believed that the financial markets would bring pressure to bear upon governments to force them to be disciplined, to respect the, uh, the Maastricht criteria. And of course that hasn't happened because the financial markets uh, chased cheap money and the stability and growth pact was breached uh, quite soon after the disappearance of coal and Mitterrand. So we have this EMU structure uh, only partly constructed, uh, a bank that is not the lender of last resort, a common monetary policy that hasn't got a common fiscal policy to back it up. Um, it was never going to work. And Cole and uh, Mitterrand and Delors saw that and said that all the time, very bluntly, both in the closed session of the IGC, but also out to the press. They were, alas, ignored. Um, uh, uh, Maastricht was also the, uh, so the beginning of uh, Brexit. Um, the single act was the uh, last treaty that the Brits signed up to uh, confidently and in good uh, f f faith. Of course, then Prime Minister Thatcher changed her mind and was pushed out of office because of the disagreements on the IGC. That was the trigger that f forced the Conservative Party to who push her out of the door. Uh, and then uh, uh, Thatcher was re 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 replaced by John Major, um, who extracted two opt-outs from the Treaty for the United K K Kingdom, the first on the uh, social chapter, and then of course on the uh, single currency. Um, Blair, uh, agreed at the Treaty of Amsterdam, which was which came on after oh, Maastricht to include the social chapter of the United Kingdom, but he always declined to join the single currency despite promises to us. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a li li liberal, by the way, uh, in permanent opposition to all these people. So, uh, 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 but so, uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, Major could uh, not have agreed the Treaty of Amsterdam. Clear? Just as uh, Thatcher declined to agree the Treaty of Maastricht, Blair refused to accept properly the Constitutional Treaty of 2004, despite pretending that he would. He had promised that he would have a re referendum in the U UK following the French and D Dutch referendum, but he, he, he believed, I think quite correctly, that, that, that if there had been a referendum in Britain, that would also have been lost. And he was, uh, sh 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 champagne was popped at 10, Downing Street on the night of the French re re referendum in 2005. Gordon Brown, who succeeded Blair, uh, only just signed the Treaty of Lisbon and late and on his own um, and failed entirely to explain it or to justify it either to his own party in the House of C C Commons or to anyone else, then uh, I wonder who is next.
Ca uh, Cameron, that's right, my God. Uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it, it's uh, from M uh, Maastricht, it was downhill all the, the way from the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is, is uh, condemned to spend another 20 whole years, I think, out in the wilderness before it might, it might uh, begin to turn, uh, it's, uh, to, to approach um, uh, a more constructive uh, approach to, the, to, to integration. Um, I'm sorry, that was a little, I mean, you, you, I mean, you don't want to speak about Brexit, and I, I certainly don't want to speak about Brexit, and, and, I, and I'm quite sure that you, that you don't, but, uh, you know, there you go. Um, just just, just uh, t t two other things about Maastricht, which I think are important. The uh, first is that it inclu included uh, the, the, the article N, as it was then known before it was integrated into the treaty, which, which um, uh, set up the IGC of uh, supposedly in uh, 1996. So at the t t t time of its completion, um, partly because perhaps of the students who were demonstrating outside with torches here, uh, the prime ministers understood that this wasn't enough and that they would have to go back quickly to the uh, drafting table. Now that process was complicated because of course, after the treaty was signed, it had to be ratified. And that proved, as you know, to be a very painful thing. D uh, Denmark um, was the oh, first in the re oh, referendum of June. 1992 to decline to accept the referendum, uh, the, the, the treaty, the British crash, crashed out of the ER, the exchange rate mechanism in September. Um, there were some fairly cynical uh, compromises glued onto the, 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 the end of the treaty to try to, um, placate the opposition forces that were growing in all member states. Uh, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht uh, was plagued by uh, appeals from the uh, right wing in Germany to deny the right of the Bundestag to approve the treaty. So the whole thing was, uh, you know, we all, grew a lot older in that experience and I, I, and I lost hair and, and um, but in that process uh, one becomes also w w w w w w wiser and one understood an awful lot more at the end of the Maastricht process than we did at the time of its initiation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. As, as we say, folly that. <laughs> okay. Uh, very good evening to you all. And um, firstly, may I congratulate you on your fortitude. I'm really impressed at 20 to 7. You're, this is what would known, be known at home as the graveyard slot in terms of a, a presentation. So um, I'm also mindful as an Irish woman, I'm standing between you all and a well-deserved drink. So I will bear that in mind uh, in terms of my remarks. But uh, thank you to Emily. Esther and UACs. Um, it, it really is a pleasure to be here this evening in the historic uh, city of Maastricht. I wasn't there for the torch presentation, but I was here once before as a, as a student over 20 years ago, so it's, it's great to be back. Um, so this evening I've been asked to, to look forward a little bit, so what I might do is I might try and tie that into wearing my multiple hats, which might be of interest to you, and very happy then to take questions afterwards. So firstly, I'll maybe look a little bit on the EU's common foreign and security policy, and then um, I will share some of uh, my observations, having been Ireland's national citizen representative to the Conference on the Future of Europe, which might be of interest. 
So when I was thinking about how I should frame my opening remarks to you on, on the really that the watershed moment in European integration that was uh, the Treaty of Maastricht, um, I, I am going to, of course, have to, to subscribe to the cliche and quote Robert Schuman in his famous declaration over seven decades ago of Europe not being made all at once or according to a single plan. And I think this can be said of the Treaty of Maastricht as it started uh, the, the period of widening and deepening European integration during the 1990s and beyond across many policy areas. The common foreign security policy is one of the most debated policy areas, of course, since it was introduced, coming under the spotlight with each new international crisis, with your, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, of course, bringing it under sharp focus um, at present. Uh, the CFSP has evolved significantly since Maastricht, reflecting the fact that foreign policy does not sit in isolation and has, of course, many linkages with other EU policy areas from trade to enlargement. Not always perfect, it was often hampered by slow, uh, timid and uh, indecisive decision making in foreign policy issues, uh, with the need for consensus between member states offering ha hampering um, action with divisions appearing and we've seen that again most recently during the discussions around the six packages of EU sanctions against Russia. We do not know uh, what the lasting impact of the war in Ukraine will be on the EU's approach to foreign policy. It, it's scarcely credible to think that we are over 100 days into the war. But the future of how the EU should conduct itself as a global actor has had an impact on the national politics of, of many countries, as we have seen in terms of Finland and Sweden, in terms of NATO. Um, and in my own country of Ireland, one of the troublesome ones, as, as Andrew mentioned, we are experts on referendum. We've had nine of them. And if we don't get the right answer in the first time, we, we, we have another chance. So if anyone wants to talk to me about referendum campaigns, uh, I'm very happy to, to do that. But what has been interesting to observe in my country is how the dial and the needle is slowly shifting in terms of having what I would term a, a difficult conversation for us as a people due to our uh, historical past on the whole issue of security and defense. And we carry out an annual survey every year of sentiment towards Ireland and the EU. And we pick a number of specific topics. And one of them is security and defense. And this year, we saw 59% of people in Ireland being in favor of closer EU security and defense cooperation. That might not sound like a lot to, to you here uh, this evening in Maastricht, but that is, that is uh, pretty significant for, for, for us. Um, uh, turning then to, uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about anniversaries, and you'll see that at the end of my speech. But if I may turn to the Conference on the Future of Europe, uh, so I have, a, I have a number of different hats in regards to the conference. Um, wearing my European Movement Ireland CEO hat, we worked very closely with the Irish government on rolling out the consultation process throughout Ireland. And that involved a really concerted campaign to reach outside the usual bubble. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, you mightn't be aware, but the second most common language in Ireland is actually Polish. We have a huge number of uh, new Irish, we say, people who've arrived into Ireland and made it, made it their home from right across the EU and, and specifically post-enlargement. So we wanted to, to get their views on what they felt the future of Europe should be about. We reached out to our uh, Irish language speaking communities, youth groups, LGTB community, and we really worked to make sure that people's voices who aren't traditionally heard were engaged with through a series of uh, online citizen dialogues and then in person when the COVID pandemic uh, permitted. Um, so it was really to see things like um, uh, people suggesting um, that the uh, European health insurance card and the, the COVID pass should be on one, you know, that the EU should look at putting that on one card and, and promoting that. That was fantastic to bring that as a suggestion to the conference on the future of Europe. And also a common theme emerged of how the EU can work to better communicate policy interlinkages and um, a 
a sharing of best practices across the different member states and the institutions. And then I, 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 and then I think um, from, uh, so that was from the domestic process that we engaged with the government and then we inputted that into our, into uh, submitted it to our Minister for European Affairs and that has formed the Irish report on the conference on the future of Europe. I then had the honor following an open competition, I just have to stress that, um, uh, full transparency and accountability. Um, I had to send in my CV and everything. Um, and I was appointed to be the Irish national citizen representative to the conference. So there was 26 other national citizen representatives. And I think I spent around 37 days of my life uh, commuting to Strasbourg. I know, Andrew, you know all about that, but Dublin to Strasbourg ain't fun, <laughs> even though Strasbourg is beautiful. <laughs> Let me not uh, deny that. But it was a uh, you know, when I started the process, it would have been very easy, to be honest with you, to have been a little bit cynical and skeptical. Um, but it it actually, and, and on paper, it shouldn't have worked. But the combination of the randomly selected European citizens, and that's what they were called, they were the European citizen panels. I was in the national citizen panels. And then you had social partners, members of the European Parliament, and each national parliament appointed representatives. And then the European Council um, uh, appointed ministers to attend the various uh, thematic groups. I was a member of the Digital Transformation Working Group, which was fantastic. We were also uh, a really productive working group. We had two fantastic co-chairs and, uh, it, you know, it, the, the process was really uh, reaffirming and, and at the end of it, we were left with, um, notwithstanding, obviously, that the horrific war in Ukraine happened midway point, which totally turned everything on its head. But it really uh, signposted uh, a way that we felt um, that uh, citizen engagement and consultation and trying for the EU to become better and more effective and work to the benefit of all its citizens is something that we feel very strongly could not be put back in the box. So I think that was something that came across very strongly for that. And the Commission, European Commission earlier this month uh, published a communication on the conference. It's now, um, I, I'm not sure how, the, how things will all pan out post the recent election results in France. Um, I think that has might slightly have changed the roadmap uh, for it, but um, you know, some of the ideas set out in the conference are, are innovative. And as I, as I reflect here, coming to my final point on anniversaries, um, and Andrew, forgive me, but you mentioned the B word before I did. <laughs> but Brexit, it's 23rd of June. Today is actually, anyway, um, we had, uh, I still have the scars. We, we, we carried out a voter registration campaign, um, not as successfully alas, as Cambridge Analytica <laughs> carried out various campaigns. But um, it's, you know, um, from an Irish perspective, this year we celebrate, we celebrated a couple of weeks ago, the 50th anniversary of uh, Ireland's referendum. And that was before all the treaties started. Um, we obviously got a flavor for it back in 1972. And uh, that was when 83% of people in the country voted uh, to join the European Economic Community, which has been the most transformative event for our, a small peripheral island that we are at the very edge of Europe. It really has. So we, we, we're recognizing that anniversary. And also as well, if I can as well, just pay tribute to the role that the European Union played in the peace process, because custom controls were introduced on the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland following the creation of the Irish state in 1922. And in the same year that Maastricht came into effect, the EU single market came into force in January, 1993. And what that meant in a very practical sense on the island of Ireland was that the custom posts, and I remember as a child crossing over the border and you were stopped, there was police, there was the army, what, what's your purpose? You know, cars were searched, it was a, it was a different era. And goods on the island of Ireland effectively then became domestic uh, products of the EU single market. So that came shortly before the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, 
which brings me on to my another anniversary, which is the 25th anniversary that we will be marking next year. And that brought decades of the troubles to the end. And it seemed that the path ahead for Ireland, for Northern Ireland and for Britain was one of partnership um, together in the European Union. So it is, it is for us, it is very sad, uh, if the UK's decision to leave the EU, notwithstanding it has made, I, I think arguably, um, the functioning of the EU more effective in certain ways that the bloc isn't there, but also um, the UK as a, as, a, as, a, as a partner in many areas, would, we would have been very aligned to their thinking. So I think uh, it, it certainly is something that, uh, that we, that we uh, lament. Um, in terms of the, the conference on the future of Europe and looking forward, um, we can't ignore the fact that there are multiple challenges facing the European Union at the moment. Rule of law, how can we, how can we purport to be a union of values when they are frequently challenged in many of our own member states? Enlargement, I have just come from um, our European Movement International Members Council and talking to some of my colleagues and counterparts in Brussels, um, who all of us managed to brave the, the travel nightmares that's going on across, across Europe at the moment. But some of the stories that they were mentioning in terms of the challenges in some of the Eastern European countries and the lack of the, 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 the despair that a lot of our Western Balkan um, compatriots are feeling in terms of uh, the progress, or the, sorry, the lack of progress in terms of their they're joining the EU. Um, so there are certainly uh, fair to say that we are entering uncharted territory. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not to quote Lenin, but you know, that, 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 that quote of decades where nothing happens and weeks when decades happen uh, seem particularly apt and true. And I think what, what we can say in terms of the future is uh, by nature, um, I, I would be an optimistic person. I think most Irish people have to be and, and are, as a rule of thumb. Um, I don't think the European Union, it, and nobody would claim it to be, is a panacea for all ills. We use an expression in our, in our public communications that we tend to nationalize success and Europeanize failure. But equally, if we think of the good things that the EU does and has done, and I think of the the COVID vaccines, the procurement. I mean, my country has a population the size of Manchester and Liverpool in the UK. How would we have been able to procure vaccines at the, the pace and the speed that the EU was collectively able to do? It has been a singular force for good uh, for the people of Ireland. And, and just in terms of citizenship, we've about 800,000 EU citizens in, in Northern Ireland. So it's just, it's, a, it's an interesting time. And I think the EU, I really hope it lives up to its, uh, its ambitions and uh, I, I think it will require concerted efforts and determination by all of us to hold our elected leaders uh, uh, and our, our politicians uh, to really keep the, the foot on the pedal and make sure that they continue to work to create a better European Union for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we did these presentations in the right order. We started with Macho, who was a little bit disillusioned for the three promises not being met. Then Andrew, uh, claiming to have become older and wiser after the Maastricht uh, Treaty, to the optimistic, uh, with a footnote, uh, but still optimistic, uh, final words by, uh, by Noel. I open the floor for questions. I look around the room to see if there's anyone who might have a question for any of the panelists or for all of them. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, it worked. Great. Uh, so my name is Jacob van der Bieten. I'm a PhD student in law at the London School of Economics. Uh, and I have a question for uh, Professor Segers. Um, because you tell a story about Maastricht, which is, which is quite, I, I thought it was quite positive, actually. I heard all, the, all these new promises, a new era, transformation. Um, but I'm a lawyer, and legal scholars, they tend a, a completely different story of Maastricht. Eh? For, for them, Maastricht is a time of bits and pieces, and, and the end of an era of legal integration, uh, and unity in, in, in the community. Uh, but instead, we get all these opt-outs, and we get the pillar structure. Right? Lawyers, they like uh, pyramids, you know, clear hierarchies. Um, all, the, all of that was gone after Maastricht, and it has been 
arguably been further fragmenting since with all these kind of forms of differentiated integration. Um, so, so would you agree that there's something to this narrative that, that legal scholars tell as a sort of a counter narrative to what you just presented? Yes, that is, that is a complicated question. So first let me answer with a simple anecdote. Uh, the the, the post-Maastricht era in European integration is the era in which uh, Madeleine Albright, Minister of Foreign Affairs under Bill Clinton said, if you want to understand Europe, you have to be a genius or French. So I think I, I recommend you to look into French lawyer analysis when it comes to uh, this, this, this question in general. But then uh, seriously, um, I think you're right with your analysis that it's this, this variety in European integration, diversity or however you call it, makes the European integration process far more complex and also maybe hinders it. It makes it also very difficult to explain to the people as we heard. And you know that is one of the key tasks that politicians of today and we as academics, but also media has, and we are, often failing in that task to translate to a wider public what is happening in European. It has to do with this variety uh, for a very uh, important extent. But on the other hand, it, it, is, um, it is needed. It is in the essence of the European integration that you should have a variety because the member states are still building this process and they are different and they have different preferences and they still want to cooperate. So you still have to, you have to invent the wheel actually every day again in the European integration process. That makes it fascinating for people like us, but it makes it also very complex. And what is, I think, crucial if you want to do the analysis that you suggest, so the, the pre-European integration uh, process, uh, pre-Maastricht and post-Maastricht and the differences, and some are in the varieties, but I think there is a more essential thing that you should take into account here is that this process was very technocratic focused on the market and then it went through the door of Maastricht or some or the port of Maastricht or however you call it uh, to another area era which is very political and uh, we are now we are now in these days we are confronted with these political challenges that have to be translated by the process itself into something, you know, new policies, new ambitions, enlargement from a new perspective, not only market, but maybe a geopolitical instrument. And then, you know, uh, lawyers always come last, you know, as politics becomes more prominent, lawyers become, you know, kind of servants uh, that have to, you know, think creatively on how to canalize the politi these political decisions into treaties, working laws, uh, new policy areas, and, and things like that. And I think in that sense, uh, it was really transformative, this move from pre-master to post-master. And we didn't realize that for long. So we worked with old instruments in a new reality, also from a lawyer's perspective. And that was counterproductive because it led to very complex technocracies, but also to uh, a blurred understanding of what the Europe of European integration, the phase historically it was in. So I think we were working with the instruments of yesterday, so to say, in the post Maastricht reality, especially in this domain of, of lawyers and, you know, taken aside, uh, and I I'm, I'm, will be very clear about that, that the most brilliant lawyers of Europe are working in the European institutions because that is where re real creativity and original thinking is needed uh, because of the, the, the context that I just sketched. I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I pondered a bit, you know, on the... No, yes, uh, perhaps I could also come in on this. I think you ought not to underestimate how political the treaty is, is under negotiation of Maastricht was. I mean, it, 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 it was far from clear at the outset it was going to work. There were many crises, including crises here in the, the, the Netherlands when the coalition was jeopardized by um, 
by people like my friend Lawrence Young Brinkhorst, just going out on on a limb. And the process that that we've been discussing was really born with the single act and the Cofield white paper on the integrated internal market, which, which obliged the uh, establishment of a re regulatory framework at the supranational level, which hadn't existed before. Now, uh, the political uh, tensions exposed at Ma 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 Maastricht then spawned a further and more uh, sophisticated discussion about enhanced cooperation, differentiated integration, uh, Schauble and L L Lammers and all of that f followed Maastricht. And it was Amsterdam that created this, um, uh, that, that, that brought in this idea of uh, a, a, a reinforced uh, cooperation that strengthened the uh, thrust to integration in justice and in interior affairs policy. So I think that Maastricht was a turning point, but it, it's not fair as it were, to blame it for all, the, all, all what has happened ever since. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. And um, I was uh, thinking that uh, maybe when the Maastricht Treaty was created, the great idealists were working for Europe. So people really believed in Europe and they were motivated and uh, inspired to create this idea to construct great relations between the countries despite the difficulties. But nowadays, maybe this is uh, challenging because I am not sure whether we have so much uh, great leaders, so inspired people. And I come from Brussels and I'm not sure whether I can see them around. So how do you think that we can tackle this? Thank you. But I mean, I, 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 I'd just be careful about uh, taking for granted, as I said earlier, in response to the previous question, that M M M M Maastricht was always going to be a success was always going to be agreed and uh, i mean th there was huge political opposition to M M M M maastricht in quite a number of member states including great britain and in france so um uh, i don't think anything has really changed i i, th I, I the the the, the uh, skill and the populist nature of the opposition has become more fierce, more sh 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 uh, sharp, and it's become more, um, more very obviously r r r r racist. But it was always there. Um, uh, I'm sorry to uh, to blunt your nostalgia about this. I mean, it's. it's um, and how things are going to go? Well, we'll see. I mean, um, there is a, uh, an experiment with a co uh, conference, which was, uh, was obviously w w w w w worthwhile for people who were, uh, who were brought into it, although it didn't bring a lot of people into it. I mean, the, the, you know, it, it was very much a Brussels experience. We've expanded the uh, so, 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 uh, the size of the Brussels bu oh, bubble, if you like, which is a good thing to have done. I'm not suggesting it's not, but I don't think that it's that that that, that it will alter the, uh, the, the nature of EU politics, especially when it now comes to the crunch decisions about how to uh, further extend qualified majority voting. Obviously, extremely necessary now, even though it was always necessary, it's now very obviously necessary with all, Orban and so forth. Ukraine, I mean, you, you can't have Ukraine in the EU if you don't have treaty change. But the 
the quarrel over how to get treaty change is intense. Um, I've proposed that the, the, the Parliament has accepted a, a proposal that I made that they will focus only on the passerelle clause. In other words, to, to li liberalize, to mo mo modify the, the uh, de de decision-making procedure of the passerelle. But the uh, commission uh, responding to, 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 to the conclusions of the conference uh, d uh, dismissed that idea by saying, well, the answer to the, a lot of the problems that, that have been brought up by the conference is the passerelle clause. But they know perfectly well that the passerelle clause can't work, is not working, is, uh, but, but they aren't uh, committing to treaty change. And so we're in a real scrape. And I don't expect um, the trains and the planes that are flying out of Brussels to tomorrow afternoon to be filled with a lot of happy people. I, d I don't know if that uh, has answered your question, I, but I, I'm not able to re re recall what your question was, Max. So. <laughs> no, it's a it's a really good question and a and a very valid point. I mean, it's it's interesting. I think uh, Angela Merkel had such longevity and tenure and went out on a high and now we're seeing uh, nuancing and uh, you know in, in terms of the the Russian response so um, hindsight is a wonderful thing as well um, but I, I I think to Andrew's point um, again I'm going to be trying to be somewhat optimistic um, it is but it's not easy <laughs> it's not easy when you see a lot of the most well-known national leaders are Orban, you know, um, and how do we how do we cope with uh, the challenges that that brings. But um, it's always been, it has always been thus there, we have been fortunate to have had some of the giants as, as Andrew referenced. Um, but things like the conference, I respectfully, okay, although it might have enlarged the Brussels bubble, it did actually bring some of the citizen panels, uh, and I think one was here in Maastricht, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, one was in Florence, one was in Natalin, and uh, one of them was in Warsaw, was it Warsaw? And, and one was in Dublin as well. Um, so, it, you know, I was encouraged by the, by the engagement of what, what were called the randomly selected European citizens, and that was the term used, um, because a lot of them, didn't come, sorry, none of them came from the bubble. They were chosen by a polling company. So they weren't, you know, they weren't uh, from, from the bubble. Um, and to see them debate and engage climate change and, 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 and just really get involved and, and call out the, 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 the politicians, the, the, the leaders, it, it was really, really inspiring. So maybe, Maybe that's the hope, you know, that that it'll come from the, the bottom up, that it'll be, uh, it'll be, uh, the, you know, we, we'll, we'll not take, uh, not take things for granted. And um, because I think we have to fight, fight for democracy. And that's showing us uh, it's never more, more important now, more than, more than ever. So I think that's, that's just my obs. Maybe to add two, two things. Um, we have a great leader at the moment from an unexpected country, and that is Zelensky. He is really showing European leadership as a non-member state and pushing real pressure on the political process in Brussels to think about new realities and to try to fit the Europe of European integration to that new realities and take on these new challenges. That is actually a strong political leadership at the moment and some were early to adapt to that call for instance Mario Draghi in Italy uh, he's showing great strength as a leader given his domestic challenges which are not not little um, uh, and also of course uh, Emmanuel Macron was there but you have also a lot of other leaders that are now doing very important things the the, the prime ministers of Finland and Sweden this is uh, accession to NATO, but Denmark is, you know, uh, getting rid of the opt out of the security and defense policy that they had uh, within the European Union. That is also leadership that underlines that they are investing seriously 
in uh, European cooperation. And this is key if national leaders start investing from their own national interest, of course, in this cooperation, then they become co-carriers of the idea. And then they become, you know, in the history, when you write that history after 20 or 30 years, and they become Europeans in that history because of that. But that, that is always because of the circumstances. So we are just people, you know, they are also just people. You are also very much dependent on the circumstances. And if they give so much pressure on that political to act politically in favor of cooperation because you're representing the interests of your own country, then they become Europeans. But it's also a bit by coincidence, you could say. There are very few who have this vision already before they uh, come to office and, uh, and uh, get responsible for the, for the national interest. And I think that is the key thing. You know, the European integration process is still a project of member states. So nation states, as long as they manage to co-carry this and to translate that to their, own, to their own constituencies, so the national democracies and make the European dimension a key dimension in national politics, then this advocacy nationally always comes together. Because if you look at the polls and the deeper investigations in sentiments and preferences of European citizens in the member states, and you always see and even now in Ireland, like a majority, a pretty strong majority that comes together on the basic norms and values and the basic ambitions formulated in Maastricht. So a geopolitical player that gives security vis-a-vis uh, -vis external uh, threats, a social justice society where you are you know, guaranteed a certain level of individual security and a citizenship project which makes which not only speaks about norms and value, but also realizes this in, in relation to the rest of the world. And that is something, uh, these three things on which a majority of Europeans still comes together, a quite strong majority. It's now up to the politicians to exploit that majority to make a step forward because the circumstances uh, ask for that. So I think we will see the birth of a, a whole new branch, a whole new generation of Europeans that we will call Europeans after 20, 30 uh, years. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Sven Spurs. I'm a PhD researcher at the uh, European University Institute. Um, so Andrew very nicely, I think, um, said that each IDC basically is a preparation for the next one. But I'm wondering how much the lessons of those IDCs carry over until the next one, or whether institutional memory is rather pretty short term and, and national leaders and delegations make the same mistakes um, time and time again. So my question is more practically, if we ever get to have another IDC, what are the lessons to be learned from, in particular, the last one, and maybe also the ones before, including Maastricht? Member. Yeah, thank you very much. My question is a bit more concerning also the future of Europe, because uh, yeah, we're celebrating the, the 30th anniversary of the um, Treaty of Maastricht. And um, could you either speak a little further away or closer oh, I'm sorry. to, to, to I'm that so extraordinary? Oh, I'm sorry. Do, do you understand me? Yeah, yeah but you... it's not very clear. Go on. Oh, yeah. I just said that, yeah, 30 years of the uh, Treaty of Maastricht. And um, from, from my perspective, uh, the Treaty of Maastricht was the correct political response to, to, a, to a changing time, to a changing world, from a technocratic European Union to a political union. And uh, now, also, what the von der Leyen Commission actually uh, stated, uh, we are in a geopolitical union. So, which means also you just said treaty change is very difficult. But how do you then think should we uh, further, uh, further uh, define and further um, design European integration? I think one interesting factor of the, what, what achievement of the Maastricht Treaty was also, for example, the establishment of the the uh, European Committee of the Regions. And uh, we have several of, of these achievements made over the last treaties. Um, but the thing is nowadays, do you think that kind of the differentiated integration between new member states, between Eastern states, Western states, economically stronger states or not that strong states could be a possibility to also achieve this goal of a geopolitical union? Because as you just said, that on the current EU summit, actually we do not see the results that we 
needed in order to see a strong union acting within uh, within the globalized world. So um, Macron was calling uh, upon international leaders to to form also maybe kind of different, not yeah, kind of political cooperation between the Western Balkan states and the European Union, also then including Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine. So what do you think, how can we uh, design European integration in the future, also including the West Balkans, Georgia, Moldova on the one hand, and on the other hand, still um, yeah, living up to the Copenhagen criteria and solving European problems internally first? Well, that's an easy question, right? <laughs> it's up to you. What do you want I to can, reflect I can, from? Um, answer brief, uh, briefly on your question with a, with a reference. I would recommend you to read the Schäuble Lammers papier from 1994, which is still available online as a PDF. Just uh, tick in Schäuble Lammers papier, CDU, CSU, and you will get it. Uh, that is an analysis of post war Europe in 1994, and it's addressing exactly these challenges and it's suggesting that the solution is in differentiation. Because what you need in a, in a wider European Union is an example to work towards, setting examples to work towards as, as, as a collective of member states. If you want to decide with everybody everything, then the most, the most severe, the most brute, hard breakman the, is, is kind of dictating what is possible. So in the current situation, when you decide with unanimity, uh, Hungary is calling the shots. They decide what is possible in the end uh, because of this. So if you want to go forward with ambitions, then you need uh, an avant-garde or how you call it to set a new example for others to, to reorient themselves, not in this breakman logic of Hungary, but in another dynamic that is a forward-moving dynamic. And I think that Schäuble Lamas papier is uh, still very valuable in terms of the general insights that it really very lucidly spells out uh, on, on these matters uh, of, of enlargement and deepening, which has to happen at the same time if you want to meet the challenges and ambitions that you formulated yourself in the, in the Maastricht Treaty. Um, uh, yes, you could also re 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 read the book that I'm going to have published in September by P o Palgrave. It's free of charge. It's it's is 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 the open access book, and it 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 has a, a catalog of uh, that will answer your question. Um, you might not agree with all the answers, but uh, I think that an answer to your question is you've got to have a, a comprehensive approach to it. You you just can't do things here and there and expect. The, 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 it will be all joined up happily ever after. It's not like that in life uh, in the EU. Um, I would say that we've got to constitutionalize the uh, structure of the European Union and improve the treaty change processes by boosting the prerogatives of the uh, convention, which is a great experiment. I mean, a really truly historic experiment and a great privilege of mine to have been in it. Um, it was not like an IGC. In uh, a, a, an IGC, you can just say uh, no and everything stops. In a, a, a convention, you have to, 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 to argue your case. G good ideas will s s s s s s surface, poor ideas will be dropped. The history of the uh, uh, a convention is just as interesting if you have a look at those things which were blocked in the convention, things that failed to be transferred into the into treaty or f form as to those things which were. The ch ch checks and b o b o b o balances were finely tuned at that point. Um, and uh, we must go back to have the courage to have a, a conventional approach, which I think would be uh, boosted by having a 
the citizens ingredient sort of gl gl glued on. I don't know how, but somehow. That is actually also what is suggested now in some Brussels circles very seriously to, to use that experience of the convention to make it into a, you know, up-to-date version of the convention, including the citizens' uh, panels uh, some way. Yeah, but it's got to be careful, of course, because the uh, re re the uh, representative credibility of a convention is important, and uh, and that it's a constituent process. So all those there have got to have a power which um, is, is recognized. And I think that's really, yes, the answer to the question that, that, that you put about just how do we institutionalize this thing. I, I think that, um, that every new president of the commission who has to search around for a new uh, tag to describe their bloody college, really, you know, one is driven to despair. Um, uh, we, we need, a serious a, a, a executive authority in the European Union. I think, actually, uh, speaking as a, a parliamentarian, I don't think the greater problem of the EU is an absence of parliamentary d d democracy. I think it's an absence of g uh, government. I think we need strong g uh, government of the EU, which, which really, apart from in the, 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 that, uh, constrained re 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 regulatory process uh, and co uh, competition po policy and that sort of thing uh, really doesn't exist. Um, we need uh, to improve the legitimacy of the parliament by having transnational li uh, lists, uh, not because they're just fun, which they, although they are, but because they will force into being federal political parties. The only w way you can have federal parties growing out of this present crisis is by having transnationalists, by obliging them to fight each other for power at an election. I mean, as you know, we have these EPPs and ALDIs and PSEs, whatever they're called, uh, but they are all, the, they are frankly c conference uh, organizers and they publish balloons and um, umbrellas and things like that oh, which, which is all excellent i mean you know that that's 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 also part of the that's necessary but they're not serious federal political parties there's a there's a completely absent sinew of democracy to connect the people and power yeah, but the which, political which, parties which itself have. are maybe also part of an ancien regime. So yes, if you are. look, yes, so, so political parties also on the national level have a yes, very yes. serious credibility problem. Uh, uh, that yes. is, and that yes, is why that's these right. new forms of democracy, more participatory democracy experience are so relevant now. Yeah, but you also have to have federal political parties because, yeah, yeah. because the, the, the scale and complexity of the problems that we now can confront in the, in the EU have transcended the uh, cap capacity of these little old states. Oh, no. I, I agree. I agree. Can I just... Oh, <laughs> drinks. No. Uh, <laughs> um, really excellent question. Uh, a lot of the citizens from the Conference on the Future of Europe, the social partners, the civil society groups signed a pledge to uh, have a, a convention and to keep the dialogue and the process going. So that has garnered a petition of, you know, thousands of signatures. So, and it's also been sent to uh, politicians and political leaders. So that's just one thing. And just in terms of uh, differentiated integration, you know, I was reminded that um, it, it, there's, it, it exists in certain ways. I mean, for example, my own country isn't part of Schengen. Mm -hmm. So if we take that, you know, the Euro, Eurozone countries Euro. are not. So it's, but, but you're absolutely right. Um, how, do we, how do we define the roadmap um, for enlargement and for that integration? And do we want that? Because let's be honest, prior to the war in Ukraine, it might not be popular to say this, but there was enlargement fatigue, I think it's fair to say, right? Yeah. 
you know? So um, when I think back on uh, Ireland, UK and, and Denmark, when, when we, we joined, uh, we had our referendum on the 10th of May, 1972. And then, you know, you're, you're, we're, we're joining very shortly thereafter. So, so it, that process is a lot. You know, the man who embraced uh, Zelensky most warmly was Emmanuel Macron, but he was, of course, one of the sponsors a couple of years ago of making the enlargement actually stop with extra kind of uh, conditions put to, uh, to candidacy uh, status. Yeah, but, but I mean, sorry, uh, but I think that was correct. That was correct. I mean, to, 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 uh, to open the do doors to... Uh, corrupt, uh, 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 nationalistic Soviet apologists isn't what the European Union is about. Now, yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, and um, he has, I mean, I'm sorry, you, you also brought this up. He, he has proposed a broader uh, political uh, community. I think that's a good idea, but I think it needs to be formalized in the Treaty of the EU. I think he sees it as a, a, an extra uh, sort of uh, an inter... That's right, a, a sort of d uh, d uh, diplomatic thing. I think it's got to be grounded in the treaties. And I've proposed, and you, when you look at my book, Free of Charge, uh, you, will, you will see this oh, fleshed out a form of affiliate membership, which upgrades the association agreements that we have and could be a place where Orban could find refuge and where the Brits even uh, might finally find a parking place, you know, that, 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 that would be... Um, <laughs> They can go on for hours. Uh, two efforts, there's more material to read. Uh, so I think I would like to invite you to break, right? Uh, uh, just, just follow up. It's outside the topic of diversity. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much for this very enlightening debate.